All right, we're live. Well, you asked for it. Nay, you demanded it. You simply cannot get enough of the weird, impractical ways that we hairless apes have invented in order to kill one another. Suppose I can't blame you. Some of this stuff is straight up loony, crazy in the coconut, literal bat shit, and I do mean literal bat shit, stay tuned. Gone round the bend insane. Well, demand and ye shall receive. Tonight, strap yourselves in because it's bound to be a bumpy ride or more likely a disastrous explosive deadly ride. Weird weapons of war too. The weapons that almost were get deep fat fried. The, the audience seemed to really like this uh, weird weapons kind of thing uh, last time, so I figured oh, yeah, almost, what the hell. Uh, all, the to- all the top comments on the last one were just like, sequel, please, sequel, please. Well, here like, you go. Hey, you know, here you go, and this one was fun to pull. You, shall receive. you throw shit at the wall, some of it's bound to stick. Well, yeah. the, here are the ones that didn't. Uh, we're, <laughs> we'll start tonight with the Treeb Flugel. This was I like a, just, can I just say that it's My a shame weapon. it's a shame this didn't catch on simply because the name is cool. The name yeah. alone is great. Yeah. This was a Nazi. Can you imagine being terrified of like, oh my god, they're gonna unleash the tree flugel. I mean, hey, dude, if this thing would have worked, it might have been literally fucking and uh terrifying to go against. Um never got past the prototype phase. Uh you can go ahead and play the video, you can mute it. Thanks. Yeah, this is Fuck. the uh, Fock Wolf Triebflugel, a vertical takeoff <laughs> and landing interceptor designed to shoot down allied bombers, also okay, known so as the Dragonfly. That. So here it is. Oh. Yeah, all right. <laughs> what? Here it is doing its okay, thing. Yeah. All right. I mean, you know, that looks pretty cool. I mean, it looks pretty fucking dope to me. Pew, pew, yeah. buckaroo. You know what I mean? There's an allied bomber. Nope, not anymore. Ha ha, treed flugled. And then, of course, a very soft, easy landing. Wow. And there you go, man. Uh, why didn't the Nazis use this? Uh, well, I first, talk. <laughs> let's talk about why this uh, innovation was necessary. Towards the end of World War II, allied bombers were absolutely ripping the shit out of Germany. Uh, most importantly, ripping the shit out of their airfields. Um, so they needed, uh, you know, this kind of fast strike fighter that didn't need an airfield or an airstrip to take off from. And so the Treeb Flugel came out, had three blades powered by rockets, could take off vertically and once in the air, fly incredibly fast, too fast and well armored to be threatened by anything else in the sky. Um, Pilots initially loved the idea until they started asking, like, but how do we land it? And nobody really had a good answer for that. Like, as you can see, the pilot's facing away from where he needs to land this thing. And between him and the ground are three flaming jet engines that even if he could turn around and look behind him, um, would obscure his view of the ground significantly. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so that uh, is ultimately why the Treeb Flugel never flew. Good idea, but just didn't have the technology to like have a computer land it, you know? And there was no way a fucking pilot was going to be able to back this giant station wagon into a parking space without... Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely innovative. I mean, because you could launch these anywhere. Like in the middle of a forest, like, okay, well, you know, we're, we're going to bomb this city. Well, halfway through, these things just launch up and attack you. It had been brilliant, but you're right. It had been a kamikaze mission. Yeah. So these things were apparently in wind tunnel testing phases when the Allies reached their production facility. Um, no completed prototype was ever produced, but if the war had dragged on, it is possible that we may have faced... The Treeb Flugel. Treeb Flugel. Yeah, dude. It's like a precursor to the helicopter. It's like, you know. It's a helijet. Trying to, yeah. Trying to figure out that helicopter technology. Didn't quite get there. Came up with this. You know? Yeah. Um, Never quite made it. But the Allies had their own ideas during World War II, uh, as we'll see throughout tonight's episode. 
One of them was the Wind Wagon. Wagon spelled with two G's. This is actually a World War I innovation, not a World War II innovation, but um, uh, the point stands. Um, the need for vehicles led to some interesting and innovative choices in World War I. Namely, someone decided to ask, so like, what if we powered an armored car with a propeller? And nobody yeah. stopped to realize that this is the exact kind of Frankenstein creature you'd create with crayons at age five when you realize that airplanes are cool and cars are cool. So what about a car that looks like an airplane? These things actually existed. They had numerous problems, which I probably don't even need to delineate for you. The foremost <laughs> being that they just basically strapped an airplane engine to the back of this thing. And it's completely open to the air, completely open to fire from all directions, right? Yeah. Um, well, was it really fast? <laughs> well, the idea behind this was uh, in World War II, uh, armored vehicles had trouble with sand. Or World War One. sorry. Uh, ar armored vehicles uh, that were made back then, vehicles in general back then, had trouble navigating sandy terrain. And so this was supposed to be an answer to that. This is like a nightmare that would blow sand all over your fucking face and everyone operating it. Uh, that's exactly what happened. So the expedited production timeline on this thing uh, meant that there wasn't a ton, a ton of time or thought put into the development of the cars from a functional perspective. So it just made sense to throw a 110 horsepower plane engine on the back of a chassis because why the hell not? Nobody thought about how to preserve the longevity of the engine which was a problem. They just kind of like strapped to the chassis, wiped their hands, called it a day. Um, the whole engine was almost entirely exposed, like I said, to fire from all angles. Even from the front, you could see the blades of the engine. So it's like you could just completely disable yeah. one of these things. Um, and the engine was completely unprotected from the main thing that this was designed to do, which was sand. So you turn right. a big fucking plane engine on <laughs> in the sand. Sand kicks up everywhere, of course. Right. And sand gets into the engine and then the fucking thing doesn't work. Um, so it's not like we deployed a whole uh, deployed a whole fleet of these wind wagons. Um, they only created one prototype, tested it, and it was a hilarious, horrible. Like, well, <laughs> this doesn't work failure of a fucking machine. Um, here's some soldiers kind of sitting in one of the early versions of the prototype. There were a number of these like wind powered cars that were tried, but this is the only military one that I could find. I mean, I was thinking about this, a giant propeller spinning at a high rate of speed. There's no, nothing to stop you from flying back. And if you're going to, you're in a car, this happens like, like when you accelerate and you like slow down. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think some if they would have deployed these, if they actually had some feasibility, people would have got chopped up by these things. Uh, I so think, yes. Gonna... I think these things would have killed more of the people operating them than they would enemy soldiers. Uh, probably I mean, the same way the Treb Flugel did. I have a feeling a better that... idea. You know, you know, I think of a better idea, Paul, putting a propeller on the front of it and just running at the people. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Just chop them to bits. <laughs> So let's talk about something a little more powerful as a weapon that I'm kind of glad never happened. Let's talk about the old blue peacock. You ever heard about the blue peacock? No. no. Uh, the blue peacock was a 1950s 10 kiloton tactical nuke designed in response to the perceived threat of overwhelming Soviet superiority in conventional weapons at the time. Mm -hmm. The blue peacock design was uh, based on the Blue Danube Freefall Bomb, a plutonium core surrounded by a shear of high explosives. The core and high explosives was then uh, encased in a steel shell. Uh, to this were added batteries and detonators, the complete uh, assembly being self-contained in a giant container. Wow. I mean, look at it. <clears throat> uh, what made it special is that 10... Blue peacocks were supposed to be buried in Germany in case of a uh, Soviet push into Western Europe, placed in the path of Soviet armies in the North German plain and armed with an eight day fuse. The seven ton bomb was also equipped uh, with an anti tampering device that would detonate it if the bomb was moved 
or the casing open once the device was armed. The whole point of these mines would have been to cover the retreat of Allied armies as well as vaporizing several thousand Soviet troops and creating a dirty no-man's land unfit for occupation, a radioactive buffer zone between Russia and Western Europe, if you like. Well, this was a, a, a well-thought-out fucking idea, you know? <laughs> yes. Like, let's build a nuclear mine that uh, will just create a fucking radioactive zone that no one can uh, you know, survive in, at least not Perfect. without horrible, deleterious health effects. And, uh, you know, let's just bury a bunch of these and then we'll just blow them up and, like, just create a big fucking swath of unusable land. Yep. I think there's Sounds a fun. I think there's a video here of the, you can mute it by the way <laughs> these uh, cuz it's got shit music. <clears throat> these yeah. are just like <laughs> some under wow. <laughs> Underground nuke test, huh? So this is kind of like the effect you might have seen from this thing. Sure. Uh these are <laughs> under sorry, I just took a giant rip. These are uh, underground nuclear tests of, of course, of varying uh, megaton strength. But this would have been what these nuclear uh, mines probably would have looked like going off. Pretty ridiculous. Um, so one of the problems encountered, was, <coughs> other than just the general concept and design of this insane fucking weapon, was that the... Blue Peacock's batteries and electronics might not last eight days buried underground when subjected to the cold German winter. Several insulation solutions were tried but failed. So these were supposed to be deployed like ahead of the advance of the Russians. They had an eight day fuse. So, you know, as you're falling back, you're supposed to bury these. And then, you know, kind of hold the line as you fall back. And hopefully in eight days, the Russians are right over on top of this and it blows. So yeah, they had um, an interesting solution for this to get around this freezing electronics design flaw. And um, I don't think anybody would guess it. Uh, does it involve chickens? At one point, what? the design included putting several live chickens inside the bomb casing, along with enough food and water su to sustain them for eight days. The chickens would produce heat that would have been sufficient to keep the bomb at operating temperature. The only modification needed was to install chicken wire around the bomb components in order to avoid the critters pecking at the stuff that should not be pecked at. Um... <laughs> Oh my God! Do the chickens were set the thing off so obviously? We have put the chicken all around it. It's fine. The chicken you know, nuke. You know, I love that we have something as sophisticated as a fucking nuclear bomb, and we're trying to build a nuclear mine. And then it's like, how do we solve this insulation problem? I know. We'll put a bunch of live chickens inside the bomb. Yeah, they should wrong. generate enough heat to keep it from freezing. It's like what? They should. Yeah, you know quote unquote who knows you know yeah the uh, project was abandoned in 1958 when the political dimension of detonating bombs large enough to create craters uh, several hundred feet deep 375 feet in diameter as well as potentially contaminating an allies country with nuclear fallout was finally discussed and taken into account <laughs> someone was like Wait a second here. <laughs> if this goes off, uh, what, is, what are the consequences for this? Uh, just a lot of fallout. No big yeah. deal. Uh, especially considering that the Germans themselves had not even been told about this plan. So Great Britain was going to carry this out um, without telling Germany that it was bearing nuke mines along its northern border. You know what I mean? Um, the Germans, of <laughs> course, did not like this idea when they were told They'd been told uh, in the past that the big containers were nuclear-powered generators. So when they were doing testing for the burying of these and stuff, and they were like, what is Vosh's loss? What is this giant thing you are burying? And they're like, oh, it is a uh, prototype uh, nuke generator there, bud. Why is it clucking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't mind that, pal. Oh, we it's filled it with chickens powder. to keep it warm. It's like, Look, what guys, the fuck is happening? They're going to cry when he spilled Nazis. All Germans at that time were Nazis. Just remember that. 
So this was so insane uh, that when it was declassified on April 1st, 2004, it was uh, thought to be an April Fool's Day joke. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's why they chose to declassify it that day in hopes that people would look at it that way, but it isn't. This actually existed. Um, I also just wrote down the name of the agency that was responsible for coming up with this. It was the Royal Armament Research and Development (laughs) Establishment. Codename Rard. Rard. Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, wow. they just needed to throw a technical in there. And I think, uh, yeah. like right in the middle. <laughs> and I think they had yeah. it about right. <laughs> yeah. Then they, uh, the name would have fit. Yep. Um, so yeah, yeah. that's the chicken nuke. Chicken nuke. That, <laughs> that almost it, happened. <laughs> Good Every time you think. Defend. Every time you think to yourself, you know, maybe the human race will make it. Maybe we're worth it. Just remember the chicken nuke. The chicken know nuke you're wrong. almost happened. <laughs> the plan for the XP-79 was fairly straightforward, intended to serve as an interceptor aircraft that can engage an incoming fleet of bombers quickly, excuse me, and effectively. Pilots responding to an inbound air raid would re- uh, rely on the onboard jet engines to power them through a series of high-speed passes through the bomber form formations, downing aircraft as they tore through them. Um, had no other offensive weaponry or defensive weaponry. Um, there were plans to put cannons on it eventually, maybe. Um, but that never came to be. Uh, aircraft was believed to have a top speed of about 525 miles an hour and a service ceiling of 40,000 feet. Pretty good for the time. Yeah, <clears throat> jet-powered uh, XP-98B only took to the skies once. Test pilot Harry Crosby in the unusual cockpit. This is him here. Um, Crosby had the plane airborne for just over 14 minutes when he attempted his first banking maneuver at around 10,000 feet. Unfortunately, as the flying ram banked, it promptly went into an uncontrolled spin. Crosby and the aircraft both plummeted to the ground, killing the test pilot. Uh, some believe he may have been unconscious through the fall, while others suggest that he may have been struck by the aircraft itself as he tried to bail out. Um, the prototype was a total loss, and the military was not impressed, and this thing was yeah, scrapped. Yeah, I would say not. Like, mm. uh, here's the first bank. Yep. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> we'll take 10. 10. 